Thanks so much for coming out tonight. This is our first Chicago event, and we're thrilled to be here. Uh, I actually went to school in the Midwest, and I'm from the West Coast, and now I live in New York, and I was walking around, and I was like, I forgot how much I love it here. Everyone smiles at you. <laughs> it's great. I love the Midwest. So I'm very happy to be in Chicago. I'm very happy we, we brought this to Chicago. Um, Women in Sales grew out of a passion project um, between myself and the founders of Clojure IQ, which is a, a sales recruiting agency in New York. I was previously at a, a small VC fund in New York. And I think we all know that women in sales is something that needs a lot more love and attention. And um, you know, globally right now, four out of 10 entry-level salespeople are women. Three out of 10 make it into management roles, and then only two out of 10 actually make it to the C-suite. So when we started this, the goal was to build the next generation of female sales leaders. We're currently live and have communities in New York, San Francisco, Boston, now Chicago. And we are launching London and Toronto in Q4 with plans to continue growing this globally through, um, through 2020. All of this would not be possible without our incredible sponsors. So Sales Loft, I know we have some lady lofters here. Thank you for, for being our platinum sponsor. Uh, Action IQ is another sponsor here in Chicago. And then thank you to Showpad for hosting us tonight in this beautiful office. Janelle, if you want to come up and tell us a little bit about Showpad. Janelle is also our <laughs> Janelle is also our New York chair for Women in Sales. She started coming to our events in 2018. She's the Lone Ranger for Showpad in New York and started coming to these events because she wanted to find a tribe. Yes. <laughs> oh, the irony, right? Yeah. Um, so yes, it was a very super organic fit. Um, obviously, when I started with Showpad about a year ago, I was hungry to be feet on the ground in the New York and, and tri-state area. So I was looking to find my tribe and find a community in which I can network with my peers, exchange best practices, tips and tricks, things of that nature. Um, found my way to Women in Sales. And when I had heard that they were looking to expand in Chicago, it was just a very organic fit uh, for Showpad to uh, to throw our hat in the ring in terms of getting involved. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Showpad, uh, we are a sales enablement platform that helps sales and marketing work more collaboratively with one another. Um, as a woman in sales, if you have any further questions about that, I'm happy to answer them for you. <laughs> um, but very excited for all of you to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and join and, and be a part of the discussion. And I think you're going to be really, really excited about the information you're sharing with here today. Thank you. So tonight, we're going to be chatting with three incredible sales leaders, all based here in Chicago. And we're just going to discuss their, their journey in sales, how they became so successful, how they got to where they are today. Um, I will let you all introduce yourselves, but warm welcome to Nicole Wiley, General Manager at Spot Hero, Jess Plack, VP of Enterprise Sales at Sales Loft, and Katie Cantwell, Director of Mid-Market Sales here at Showpad. Thank you for being here. Nicole, do you want to kick us off and, and tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are? Sure. So, hello? Is this? Okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Wiley. As um, Alex said, general manager at Spot Hero. Uh, my career trajectory has been very interesting. I started in the beer industry right out of college, um, which then brought me to this small startup that some people were, you know, signing up on the street called Groupon. Um, some of you have probably gone through that. Um, and that brought me ultimately to Spot Hero. So I was in sales and management at Groupon. Then when I joined Spot Hero, I was one of our first salespeople there, and then moved into the management sector. Um, and you know we grew from about 20 people, and now we're at about 200. So it's been a really cool ride, and yeah. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Jess Kleck. I am our VP of Enterprise Sales at Sales Loft, which is headquartered in Atlanta. Um, for those of you who don't know what Sales Loft is, we are the premier sales engagement platform, um, which basically helps organizations operationalize their go-to-market strategy. Um, so a little bit about me. I started my career here in Chicago at Career Builder. Maybe some of you <laughs> also started there. Um, enjoyed a really fun career there for seven years and then 
um, had some time at Salesforce, um, and then spent a really fun five and a half years at LinkedIn in various leadership roles, and now I'm running enterprise sales for SalesLoft. So excited to be here with you all today, and looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. Hi, I'm Katie Cowell, and I'm the director of mid-market sales here at Chopin. Um, I have a little bit more of a circuitous route from point A to point B. Um, I spent the vast majority of my career in marketing, so I worked for companies like Volkswagen and Audi and um, a company named um, Runsheimer, who my old boss is right over there, Donna. And, Hi, Donna. Um, <laughs> then I had always throughout my career been very encouraged by people like them to, um, to try sales. And so I left Runsheimer to join a really small startup called Oracle. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to leverage that marketing and marketing technology um, skills that into a sales job selling, selling marketing technology for the Oracle marketing firm. That pretty quickly translated into a leadership role there and then brought me to Showpad. So it's been a really great, um, you know, kind of less of a traditional route. Um, I'm a mom of four who has kind of like worked her way through her career to get to where I am today, but it's been kind of cool. Thank you all. So Jess, we're going to kick it off. Yep. All right. <laughs> this novel ride, Career Builder. Career Builder has a great name in Chicago and a global name. Why did you decide to leave Career Builder and, and eventually go to Salesforce, and what was, what was the for pivoting into a more enterprise um, I appreciate this question so much because um, I think I was enjoying a ton of success, not I think I was, enjoying <laughs> a ton of success at Career Builder. Um, but for me, it was the same role for seven years. And at that point in my career, I loved that. I loved that. I knew what I was doing. I became an expert in my field. I was making a ton of money. I was traveling on Career Builder's time. I was sitting in front of CEOs of billion dollar staffing companies and having conversations and owning those. And for me, it became not about trying to be in the enterprise. It became more around what was I passionate about? Was I passionate about being complacent in my role and just owning that? Or was I passionate about finding something that would challenge me? And so it was a tough decision. But when I think about my career in general and women in general, I think we are sometimes faced with that conversation of, do I stay in a role that I know I'm really good at, or do I do something really scary and take a leap of faith and not know if I'm gonna be great at it, but Nicole knows what I'm talking about, but do it anyways because we're passionate about it. And for me, it worked out because I, I loved getting into more of the technology space. That's where the rest of my career has led me to. And so less about moving into the enterprise and more about being comfortable being uncomfortable. And Nicole, you, you had a similar kind of situation. You worked for Vaughn when it was a small company and, <laughs> and went through quite a ride there. Uh, what what did you learn when you're kind of going through that crazy growth period that prepared you for the role now? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, some people yeah. are very familiar with that ride when I started. <laughs> there were about 400 people at Groupon. Uh, when I was fortunate enough to be calling into the LA market, and when I would call people, call businesses, of uh, restaurants, hair salons, you name it, I called it. Um, it was grew what? <laughs> a group, a group coupon, like a coupon <laughs> for, for you know. We're trying to get a lot of people to, to make the deal tip. Back in the day, you, you had to sell a certain amount of coupons in order for everybody to get the deal. Then pivoted away from that, but um, what? brought me to Groupon was just the energy that the Chicago market had. And I was, you know, in my beer sales days, like it was very much a, wow, this is like, look what Groupon is doing for local businesses. And this is the time that the economy was crap. So a lot of businesses were closing. I know that I single-handedly helped some businesses stay afloat during those times. And I'm really proud of that. And I can still go back to a lot of my merchants and, they remember who I am because I helped keep them in business. Um, and so when Groupon approached me, they actually approached me a couple of times about being a manager. And I was like, I'm making too much money. <laughs> 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 to Jess's point, like, 
I know what I'm doing. I'm doing a great job. Like, I want it. But there was this inkling. And I played basketball in college. I know it might be shocking given how, how short I am. Um, <laughs> but so I was always a part of the team and always, you know, a leader and like loved that pushing myself, making myself uncomfortable. And it was that thought of, well, I can always go back. If I don't like it or I don't succeed, I can always go back to what I know. But here's a really great opportunity to get management experience. And we, at Groupon, we were really fortunate that they were investing in their sales leaders at the time, which is not the most typical for a lot of tech companies. Group, Companies like Sales Assembly, like I wish you were around when Groupon had started, because, but we were really lucky. Um, so that gave me a lot more school, skills and tools that I've been able to use now at Spot Hero with the teams that I manage, um, and also just like my own personal growth and success in sales. Um, so I think I answered your question there. A little, I'm a little bit of a tangent, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was great. Yeah. And Katie. You did. You wrote Oracle. The startup. <laughs> and then you went to a startup. And Show has a larger startup, but it's still a startup. Did you have an aha moment? This is what I'm excited about. What was the decision making process? Yeah, um, sort of. I, so I, I really echo with that sense mm -hmm. of being challenged and feeling complacent and feeling comfortable. And I was certainly feeling that way at Oracle. Mm -hmm. I was working from home. I had that was very much running very successfully. And to be honest, when I got the call from Showpad from a recruiter, I was like, please don't ever call me again with any ridiculous startup <laughs> offer. <laughs> it's still not me. And then um, I, they called again. And I'm like, well, let me, let me see. So what it came down to for me was um, really believing in the leadership of the company and the vision of the company and the space that, um, that we're in. Um, I found it to be a really unique opportunity career-wise because sales enablement is sort of an emerging space and an emerging practice. And so that's really exciting. I liken it to back in the dinosaur days when I was working for Volkswagen and we were starting to buy Salesforce. And we were looking at different CRM. We were like, oh my goodness, this could change everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. But, um, but I... I hear that in our customers' voices now. Like, oh my goodness, this could change everything. And it, that's exciting to be a part of that. And then, um, you know, on a personal level, it was an exciting opportunity to come to a company where I basically got to hire almost every single person on the team. And that's a really, really unique opportunity to build. And so I feel very heavily invested in these people as individuals. And um, it's exciting. It's a really fun place to be in my career. Yes, that is. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, for me, that's part of moving into different roles and the challenge that I love so much is building. Um, and I've had the good fortune to work for larger organizations that have empowered me to build something there. So kind of fail-proof. Uh, but joining an actual startup, I've taken that experience. And I think the team I've built at SalesLoft has been by far the most incredible team that I've ever worked with, and I'm so grateful for them because we're all sort of building this together, right? You have that camaraderie, and I think there's something so special about having a team go through all of the building stages versus just like kind of assimilating in or having people that have been there or having more of an established um, organization to support you. So it's been so much fun. I love that, and something that I've heard a lot, especially when I was on the talent side of things, was that people had this fear of taking a step back. There was this idea of like, you know, I, I don't want to take a step back in title, I don't want to go to a smaller company, because that feels like a step back. And well, you have worn every hat possible <laughs> at Spot Hero. You were a, I wrote it down. Um, you were a divisional sales manager at Groupon, and then your first role at Spot Hero was AD. That was probably intimidating yeah. a lot of us. <laughs> 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 we're on a timer. <laughs> uh, Tell us about that decision. Was that, was that difficult? You know, it wasn't difficult because it was something that was actually touched on earlier. Um, when I chose to leave 
Groupon, it was a lot of it was a, a leadership choice. Like I was not happy with the, the direction that the people that were supposed to be teaching me and training me and making me better, I didn't feel that they were invested in me in that way. And when I, when Spot, and I got introduced to Spot Hero to one of our co-founders through a former Groupon friend who knew that I was like kind of on the fence, like eh, what's going next? Um, and, and when I met Mark, our CEO, he and I were supposed to meet for like, I don't know, like half an hour, like an hour and a half later. And we just had this really great conversation. He was so passionate. He had also done the sales job, which nobody in the C-suite at Groupon had done at that time. Um, and he was really excited about like, not only making this company something, like you're not gonna park, you're gonna spot hero. Um, but instead he, he was really also invested in people being like becoming better people, getting educated on what, so like for me, the title didn't matter because I was going to build something and going to be a part of something that I was really excited about. And granted, I also had the safety net of like, well, if this fails, because you know, one every five startups fails, like, we're probably a lot higher than that. But, um, <laughs> but I could always go back to Groupon would be there, but like, this was something really exciting that I believed in that was going to change the ecosystem. And I really liked that idea of like disrupting a totally different market environment, whatnot. Um, and so, yes, I took a step back, but I never even thought I about it. Back. No, no, but like, but like in a title, if you were just to look at my LinkedIn, you'd be like, whoa, what, like what happened there? <laughs> and it was it, like, to me, I was like, call me a janitor. like. Just give me a phone, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna make this work. And like six months in, my boss left, and Mark came to me and was like, "I need you to run the sales team." And by the way, we need to hire like five additional people. So like, here you go. But I kept doing what I was doing, and like my title never changed. And for me, that wasn't, it wasn't a part of like my identity. Like I knew what I was doing, and what I was doing was really cool, and it was building an organization, and. The, the, the additional titles that came were just more like, oh, we should probably like give you a little bit more credibility of what you're doing. And I was like, oh, okay, that sounds good. Like it makes some new cards and I'll change my signature. And so for me, it was never something like, I don't use my title as an identity. Like it is what I do, but I do so much more. And like my, like, my title doesn't even explain what I do, so I get to explain what I do, and I get really excited about it, and I hope that like other people can too. So, I, yeah, I mean, to me, it was if you believe in a company, maybe you should fight for a better title. I, I can't say that like it would mean a lot, but I know when recruiters are looking, it is something <laughs> that you should be more aware of. So I think you know, probably learning opportunities. I, it was one of the things I got most excited about when we were first introduced is there's a story there, right? Like you saw something bigger than just moving up a ladder that everyone is apparently supposed to climb and you're supposed to go from manager to senior manager. It's, there, there's so much learning and there's so much to do and I think it's a good lesson for everyone. Uh, this is kind of a, a broader question for the whole panel and Katie, I'll volley it to you, but we talk a lot about leadership, we talk a lot about mentors, something that comes up at almost every single one of our events is this idea of having a personal board and having people that you can go to and volume you get a lot of. Um, is the best leadership advice you've ever gotten from a mentor about your career or how to navigate your career sense? Yeah, for sure. I have, um, I've really been blessed with a lot of mentors within the software industry throughout, since I started at Oracle. Um, friends that I've met through like, my personal life and friends that I've met at work. And, and consistently, it's sort of, I would reach this out, like, you can't worry about like climbing that ladder and getting to that next title. Because really, um, a lot of my friends who are working at software companies like SAP or Adobe or, or Oracle are individual contributors many, many, many years into their career and making far more money than they would <laughs> as a manager with far less stress. So that was definitely, definitely a learning. And then something um, that I wish, I, I say this all the time and I still need reminding, but I wish I had realized earlier on is that 
we chose a profession of sales, and that means our emotional life is like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you can just <laughs> if you can just keep it sort of in the middle, you're gonna your family will be happier, and your friends will be happier, and certainly your team will be happier. I need reminding. I know. <laughs> um, but really, that's that's really trying to maintain that is so important, I think, as sellers, we all need to kind of be cognizant of that, whether we're leading a team or whether we're individual, because we're leading somebody in our life, and we need to sort of keep that in check. And Justin, you're a working mom as well, and somehow always managed to answer my emails faster than most people, <laughs> despite also building it at home and, and doing all, you know, a million different things. Work-life balance, this first gets going around a lot, is it work-life balance? How do you, how do you think about it? Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there is such thing as balance. Um, I think it's, for me, it's harmony and sort of how the pieces of my work and my life sort of fit in that day, right? And it's sometimes I'm over-indexing on work, right? Sometimes I'm not putting my son down to bed. Sometimes I'm traveling from coast to coast, um, and then sometimes we're building a house in Michigan and spending weekends there with our kid, right? Like, for me, it's all about being able to be continually inspired and passionate about the work that I'm doing, and also set that example for my son that it's okay that his mom is doing all these things, but I'm still mommy, right? At the end of the day, I still get to be mommy, but I still also get to be a badass sales leader. And to me, they're equally important. Thanks, Nicole. My personal dream. By the way, speaking of badass, <laughs> um, I just joined Beachbody. You guys don't know what that is. It's, yes. Uh, time to get my shit together after having a baby three years ago. Uh, Nicole and I used to live in the same building, and she's now my beach body coach, and she came to support me today. So if you want to get your shit together, come on. Oh. Cover this is sponsored by Beach Body. This body is like, yeah. yeah. No, totally. Um, it's something that I am always like, like I, there's always like this strive for this like work-life balance. And for those of you who might be familiar with the name Mike Gamson, he sits on our board. It's another reason why I joined Spot Europe because we have this amazing board of directors. If you're ever looking for a job, look at the board because it usually can tell a pretty good story about like where the company could be because you, you've got some like really good visionaries. And Mike is one of those people. Um, he was at LinkedIn forever and just left to like travel around the world with his family. But he came and spoke at, at Spot Hero and he was like, work life balance is bullshit. No. <laughs> He's like, there are priorities in your life and you build everything else around them. So he said, I come home at five o'clock every day, no matter what, because I have to cook my the meal or my wife will burn down the house. <laughs> he said, or our kids won't be. And he said, but then I get on the phone at, you know, 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m., and then I'm up at 5 a.m., you know, on the phone from all the different countries that he is, was overseeing. Um, and he said, so it's just you make, you carve out those priorities and build everything else around it. So he, when he was opening up offices across the world, he picked up his family and they traveled all over the world with him because his kids were young enough. So it's just making those decisions. And so that's kind of like, like I am, I am a fur mom, so um, not yet a, not yet a people mom, um, but I do feel like my team are my children. Um, but I think that it's really important that like, you know, that you do find some sort of like what works for you and like stick to that and be true to that because that is the only thing that you can really focus on um, is like what makes you happy. I'm a fucking child, I'm sharing now. I have so many thoughts about this. <laughs> but, um, I completely agree that the concept of work life balance is complete bullshit because it implies that it needs to be like a 50 50 split of quality time with whatever, whomever, and work. And life is not like that. Like the reality of anybody in this room situation is we're going to spend more hours at work 
or in my case, I live in Milwaukee, so I also commute. So I'm spending far more hours with Chris Car Crosrow than I do with my children. <laughs> I don't think that they are. Uh, I don't. I know my family would not describe it that way because I strive to be present when with them when I'm with them, and be present here when I'm here. And be merciful with myself when it doesn't work out that way. And that's something I've definitely learned over the years is that I've had to let a lot of shit go <laughs> about like striving for perfection in, in every aspect of my life because it's not healthy and it's not, there is no such thing as a balance in that way. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think I, I've talked to so many women in our community who love their careers and love sales, but they pour everything into their career. So this idea of doing anything else is really daunting because they don't want to not be the top seller. They don't want to not be the best of their job. They're afraid that everything else interfering with their life on that they won't do that anymore. Um, and so I, it's, it's always one of my favorite questions for, for the women who have figured it out. I well, think also I think also that the time, you know, I think we've also sort of evolved past a point where there definitely was a point in my career, especially in my sales career, when I would look across maybe the QBR table and think, well, sure, your wife makes dinner. And, you know, like you have that support system at home that, you know, many of us as women in sales do not have. But I think that's shifted a lot, you know, like more and more and more and more and more, the vast majority of people are too to income homes and um, people do not have that, you know, it's not like we're unevenly stacked anymore in order to be that possible. So this is a question for everyone before we get to Q&A. You could go back in time and give advice to yourself as an up and coming seller, what would it be? I really like this question. Um, it, it actually, I was thinking about it because you touched on it when we were talking about mentors and something that I didn't do in my early career was like seek out mentors. And you don't have to deliberately do that. Like, you know, hey, will you be my mentor? Like that's kind of weird and creepy and I don't know how I feel someone asked me. But, but please feel free to ask. But identifying that there are these people that are going to help guide your career trajectory. And I've had those people, I've never identified them as mentors until that kind of buzzword started. Um, so like, you know, think about those people who are helping you make decisions and go back to them. Like, I had a mentor very early on who's a family friend, fabulously successful career in the sports marketing company. And, and when I was in high school, I was like, oh, I really hate my basketball coach. Like, I'm gonna quit. And he was like, no, you're not cool you're going to go to college. You can get into a better college because you're going to play basketball there. It's going to open more doors and it's going to lead you to an experience that like not a lot of people get to have. So I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I did. I, I got into a really great university. I played all four years there. Some of my best friends as a result. It's also how I got in the door of Anheuser-Busch because it was in St. Louis. So it did really help guide me. But then, it, you know, when I was getting to that pivotal point of college graduation, like, I don't know what to do, I want to be in sports marketing, but I don't know what to do, I want to like come work for your company, it's like, I just can't get But he was like, but you have the best sports marketing company in your backyard, go get an internship. So I did. Literally, like, just, and so, but I never thought of him as a mentor, and so like whenever I'm thinking about things, like I just happened to like, you know, grab lunch or grab drinks or, you know, I'll see him, and, just talk through and he's always just like thinking about the next thing and it's really it, you know he is one of my probably first mentors but I never thought about it that way so like seek out those people that do give you sound advice and follow it and then like keep going back to them so that would be more advice. I love that um, my advice to my younger self and younger individuals would be you deserve it right I think if someone would have told me back when I was 25 that I deserve to have my voice heard, I deserve that promotion, I would have been a lot better off, right? Because I think, especially as women, we are, I've said this before, but we are often the ones that are doing the hardest work, but we are the last ones to say, we're doing the hardest work. So I would say you deserve it. Own your career, own 
that voice at the table. Do not let anybody tell you that you can't have a voice, right? Especially about your career trajectory. I have left organizations because people have tried to put me in a box. You can achieve literally anything you want to because you deserve it. If you have earned the right to be there, then own that right. And advocate for yourself. And 100% advocate for yourself. Absolutely. No one is going to advocate on your behalf except for you and you're your best own advocate, right? So those are things that I think for me, I would have told myself, like, you deserve it. You earned that position, now own it. That's kind of that. It was perfect. <laughs> that was very well said. But I was going to say a similar thing, that you may need to advocate for ourselves, and I think that that's something that's difficult for us as women to, to um, be that person to say, it's time for me to move on to the next thing. It's time for me to take the next challenge. And um, we kind of, in my career at least, and I see a lot of women around me doing the same, where I kind of wait for that, for someone to notice how good I am, right? Where no one's noticing, you know? I mean, people notice that you're hitting your numbers, people notice that you're blowing it out, but you have to be the one to stand up and say, I want that next thing, and at least put it out there. Great advice. I think everyone probably came with questions tonight, so, we are going to move to Q&A for about 10, 15 minutes. A uh, couple of ground rules for Q&A. Please keep your question to 30 seconds, and please make it relevant for all the panelists. If you have a specific question for one panelist, we've been working afterwards and grab them. Uh, refrain from panelists hiring clubs, please. This is a city space. And, uh, we are going to be doing a raffle for air pods after this, so once we get to the Q&A, don't jump up and don't rush wonderful women, although you were totally allowed to do that after the raffle. <laughs> <laughs> so, first question. I'll... Uh, so, as far as being an individual strong contributor to salesperson, like obviously you've spoken to that, but as far as moving into a role where you oversee a sales team and with the ups and downs of the day that you kind of described to me, how do you approach that moving into managing the question was successfully moving from an individual contributor role into managing. When I moved from an individual contributor role at Oracle into managing a team, I actually moved into managing the same team I was on. So I was managing my peers, which was very difficult because it was a vastly varied group of people with vastly varied um, experiences at Oracle, tenure success, whatever. And I found that sweet spot of getting people to both respect me and to align with the goals was to really focus on a process and to focus on that basic sort of blocking and tackling of not just, I'm going to call you and how your deal's going and you're going to say, it's fine, don't worry about it. But we're going to have like a very strictly defined process of how we're moving deals through cycles, how we're forecasting, how we're, you know, how we're moving deals through close. And that was consistent across the entire team. So people knew what to expect from me. And so it kind of eliminated that, well, why should I be talking, you know, why should I, why do I have to answer for her to her now when last week she was my peer? Yeah. Uh, for me, going from IC to leadership revolved a lot around the culture. So I had opportunities to move into leadership at a couple other um, organizations, but for me, I just didn't feel like it would be the right place for my leadership style. Like, I very much come from servant leadership mentality. I'm very much about encouraging my people to bring their full selves to work. And for me to be the best leader I could be, I needed to find a culture and an environment that would support that. So I would encourage you, if like, you want to make the leap from IC to leadership, make sure it's in a place that you feel like you can flourish and be supported. Um, and, and certainly ask for help, right? It's, it's a hard job being a leader. It's like being a therapist and a mother and a friend <laughs> and a cheerleader and a boss, right? Like there's all of those things rolled into one. So if you don't have the right environment or the culture to support your style, like Sales Loft, I'm very lucky that it supports my style of leadership, uh, then I would suggest like, making sure you're making the leap at the right time and the right place. Exactly. No, I, 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 I totally, I, 
I echo exactly. Like, it, I think the environment is probably one of the most important factors because everybody has different management styles. Some places, it's you know, you've got that like taskmaster, and you, you need to make eighty dollars a day and close twenty deals a month, and if you don't, you're out of here. And like that, that works for some people, but like for me, not so much. Um, and you know, and so I think it definitely depends on the environment, and that is really important. Um, and, and that you have also support, especially if you're a new manager, you need to make sure that whoever is you're reporting to, or you've got other people, other peers that you can lean on to help you really like learn the ropes because it's not it's not easy in the beginning. I think it's crazy if anybody ever tells you that. I don't think anybody will, but yeah, that helps. Right, which is the pro cons list, but then you can also get into that paralysis by analysis, right? Like, well, how should I weigh this pro versus this con? Um, I think the best advice is to really like intrinsically look at what you're motivated by and what you're passionate about. And if you're passionate about something, then I think the cons sort of like are less weighted, right? They might not have as many pros, but you're passionate about that, you'll make it work. Um, I also think having a personal board of directors, Alex and I have talked about this a bunch, but it's intrinsically important because you can go to those people and get varying degrees of advice. And I encourage everyone, like I always go to someone that has less experience than me because they have a different viewpoint. I go to someone that's been around a really long time because they have a different viewpoint. I go to someone external, um, someone that's not in business, right? I think you need to get differing viewpoints on your situation, but ultimately, Roxy, it's about what are you passionate about? Like, what's motivating you? What do you want to achieve? Like, for me, I I want to be a CRO one day, right? I wanted to be that five years ago. Wasn't, but I'm getting there. I've said this again. But, like, this is my path. And every decision I make is about the passion that I'm trying to fuel, right? So decide what you're passionate about, and then the pros and cons kind of go away. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I have a question about um, teams. Have you ever run into a situation where you got one impression when you hired someone and then you found a team disappointing you maybe six months in and you realize So, so understanding when a new hire is someone that you continue to train or maybe isn't right for role or something for various reasons. Um, I have had that. <laughs> I have had that. Um, I think that it's really in this case, it was a situation, I think, I mean, ultimately this person had to leave, right? Um, because it just wasn't a good fit for where right. that person was in, in their career and their life. But yeah, that's a very, very, very difficult part of management. Because, like, like I said, you become emotionally invested in some level with every person you hire. And you hire them because you believe in them. So it's hard not to feel a sense of disappointment when they don't turn out. Or what you thought they would be. Um, and I think that there is, um, like I said, you know, trying to take it personally. It's hard not to take personally. And you want to, at least I want to, like, let's figure out what the problems are and let's try to, let's try to coach the problem. But sometimes the problems are bigger than you can fix. And at that point, you have to decide, okay, this is not, this is not the path for you. 
and um, that can be extremely difficult to do. Um, I, I think you nailed that. Um, the only thing I would add is understanding their level of self-awareness about the yes. situation. Right, like if they're yeah. self-aware enough to know that it's also not a fit for them, then it's a much easier conversation. Sure. Listen, this isn't working out for us. I want to, I want the best for you. Let's right. figure out a next play here or a next play elsewhere. But if they don't have the self-awareness about them not fitting into that role, it's extremely difficult. Um, and the coaching I would give you there is to have a very direct conversation with that individual. There is nothing worse than having a leader that does not have the capability to have a tough conversation right. with you and to find out about your performance or about an issue or you're being let go and it's a surprise. Like right. it should never be a surprise. Right. I always like to think of it in terms of, is it a hardware or a software issue? Because one I can coach you, the other one, it, and, and it's just, it comes down to that, like is this person hardwired and, and able to do this job or are they literally just not capable? But if they still have a good attitude and are still a good part of the culture, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to then maybe identify where there may be an opportunity. But you also have to understand as a manager what motivates them. Right. What are what are their soft like their short term and their long term goals, both personal and professional? Mm -hmm. That's something I talk about with my team all the time because it helps you understand like well where do you want to get to because. Either this role is the right stepping stone, mm -hmm. and this might just not be the right organization, or this might be the totally wrong fit, and then we need to move you out to another department as long as you are performing, because I would never want to pass along. But like, if it's a cancer, if somebody is literally ruining the team from the core, you need to get them out as quickly as possible, yes, but it shouldn't be a surprise. Like you should be that direct with them. Like no conversation that I have with any of my team, they can tell you, like they know where they stand at all times. Like it's very, it, you have to be that direct because, but, but yeah, if it's a cancer, it can literally ruin the text. I've had, had it happen at other organizations where it's literally ruined teams because they're just that like, happiness well, is, Expectations are really great. So it's all about setting the expectations, and if you're consistently doing that, then you'll expect a really strong Um Surprise, and that it's done quickly, at least in time. We think that's one more. Um, thanks. Uh, really quick question. I was at the top, you mentioned uh, stats about sales, sales leadership. Um, let's assume if you don't mind you're talking to a group of full. Uh, male individual contributors that want to see change effectively, right? but they're not in a position to make hiring decisions, they're not in a position to allocate budget or headcount to hire a head of diversity and inclusion for the hiring consultants. What advice would you give to those folks that want to see change effective, um, but that right now are maybe in a position where they're simply just not being part of the problem, but they want to become part of the solution? I love that. Um, and obviously, my what I'm about to say is is smart because it was something I did. Because when I started at Spot Beer, there were 20 people, and I was I was the only woman on the sales team. But I saw like some collateral that we were going to be putting out to like the general population to like come hire at Spot Hero, and it was a bunch of white dudes. <coughs> and I walked into Mark's office because we had the relationship, and I said. There is an issue because what we are displaying in these pictures is not what represents our company at all. He literally redid the photo shoot the next week. So like if you have that, you need to be a voice for, for diversity and inclusion across every specter, not just female, not just black, not just white, like at every, at every cross because it, the more ideas that come into a room, I think the more successful companies are going to be. We just have to speak up. Yeah. Matt, first of all, thank you for such a thoughtful question. Um, super appreciative. I think um, if you are in a position where you don't have budget and you are not making hiring decisions, the best thing you can do is advocate, right? You have a voice. Uh, the best thing you can do is when you're having other conversations with other guys in the office, put a stop to anything that is not in line with what you are standing for. 
right? Be the voice that is supportive of the other, like you said, not just women, right? Like all of the other communities that are underrepresented most of the time in technology organizations, specifically in technology organizations. Um, so the best thing we can ask for you, like we, we just started our Women's Integrated Network at SalesLoft, so inspired and excited by the program, but it's because we have male allies that are joining that program that are also supporting our mission. So any, any gentleman in the, in the audience tonight, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, it speaks a lot about your just character. So we're happy to see you in the audience, but be the voice for us, right? Sit across the table from us and help elevate our voices because that's how you can best support us. That's well said, as usual. She's very good. <laughs> <laughs> but, she didn't catch up with I know, I know. But I would also echo that um, we need to be the voice, but also we need to be the voice to that next generation of sellers. In my personal experience for hiring this team, um, I really was surprised by how few women applied to be a mid-market sales rep in Japan. I was very surprised by it. And um, to me, that speaks to, uh, I saw a sales coach for many years, and he always said, nobody graduates from college and says, I'm going to be a salesperson. <laughs> so, I think we need to be talking to our daughters and the, women, the young women in our life about how this is a great career choice. And this is not a, you know, this sales is an art, it's a science, it's a, a great, great ride. And I think we need to be talking to that younger generation of women sellers. Um, Beyond that, I think we just need to, you know, like like this, like women in Showpad has been an enormously supportive, supportive environment. Um, we've been very um, blessed with a, a business development hiring manager who's very um, has an eye on hiring those that that fresh sales type of talent and keeping a very diverse um, diverse group, and that helps me because that's my pipeline of talent. So um, while I'm not starting from scratch today. When I'm looking at my next group of AEs, there's a lot of women in my group, and I, I feel really good about that. I can talk about this for hours, <laughs> but I, I think my biggest point would be be really proactive and don't be reactive. It's very easy to be a company that is late in your growth and look around and go, holy shit, my whole sales team looks the same. Yeah. And then you go in panic mode and you put arbitrary quotas on your managers to go out and only hire women or only hire uh, underrepresented groups. And, and that actually puts a chokehold on a lot of things. And so if you're really thoughtful about being proactive about this from the beginning, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, we also know that women don't apply to roles unless they hit every single mark on a job description. So starting That's there. Um, there are a million things you can do, and, and you know, I again, spent my career in talent, and I reached a point where I was talking to women in sales every single day, and then also talking to sales leaders or CEOs, and women in sales were frustrated because they felt like they couldn't grow their careers, where on the flip side, companies were saying, we really need to hire more women in sales, and there was nothing bridging that, which is why we started this. Um, but it's, if you can help lift one woman in sales up, and push her to apply for the role that seems scary or she doesn't feel qualified for, or push her to take advantage of an opportunity that she feels like she can't do, you are making a difference. There's room for all of us at the top, guys. Right? It doesn't have to just be one woman or one man. There's a lot of men. But there's room for all of us there. So pull each other up, if that's the other message. Well, thank you all so, so much.